My name is uh, Peter Ramenta. I am Dean of UMDNJ Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and it's my pleasure and distinct privilege to welcome everyone here today to this wonderful event. This is the inaugural lecture of the President's Lecture Series to celebrate the investiture of President William Owen, our fourth president of the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Today's panel discussion, Healthcare Reform and the Impact on Academic Health Centers, is certainly timely and integral to the mission of the university and its schools. We're fortunate to have this wonderful panel of experts whom uh, I want to thank for joining us today. I would also like to add that just, this is just one of many events that will, be, will occur across the university in conjunction with the investiture. As so many of you are aware, the formal ceremony took place yesterday as part of the university-wide commencement at the Izod Arena, and it was truly a wonderful, wonderful day. And I'm told it was the uh, climax of a wonderful week of, uh, of uh, convocations, certainly one that we had also at our school. Dr. Owen, may I ask you to stand so that we can recognize you and congratulate you on your investiture. <laughs> Dr. Owen will join the panelists later in the program and share his thoughts with us at that time. Right now, I'm going to introduce uh, today's moderator, Dr. Denise Rogers, Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic and Clinical Affairs at the, at the University as well as Professor of Family Medicine at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. She is particularly interested in leveraging the resources of the university to improve the health status of all New Jersey residents with special attention to the minority and underserved populations. Prior to becoming Executive Vice President, Dr. Rogers served as the University Chief of Staff and Senior Associate Dean of Community Health at our medical school here. Before joining the medical school in 1997, she was a prof professor and vice chair in the Department of Family Medicine at University of California, San Francisco. She also served as the director of the UCSF uh, General Hospital Family Practice, residency program director, chief of service of family and community medicine. It's a lot of jobs, Denise. <laughs> My pleasure, Denise Rogers. Good afternoon. Um, so before I actually start, I'm, I'm uh, moderating this, this panel discussion, so I think it would be appropriate for me to ask the panelists to come up so that you could see who I'm talking about when I do these introductions. So if the panelists will join me up here uh, on stage, and um, Commissioner Howard, if you would just sit toward the end right here. Um, I, the most directive I've ever been of a health commissioner in my life. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> And then everybody else just uh, fill in, if you will. So I want to, uh, I want to start by saying what a, uh, what a pleasure and privilege it is to be able to moderate this panel of these incredibly uh, distinguished uh, leaders and thinkers in healthcare. Um, one of the things that uh, we are hoping for is that after our panelists uh, make their presentations, um, I will ask a, a question or two, but what we really want to do is to give you in the audience an opportunity to ask questions as well. So uh, if you hear something that raises a, uh, a question in your mind, uh, just jot it down because you're going to get an opportunity uh, to, to hear uh, your questions answered. So let me start uh, by uh, introducing uh, Commissioner Heather Howard. Uh, on November 29th, 2007, Governor John Corzine nominated uh, Heather Howard to be the 14th Commissioner of the Department of Health and Senior Services, and she was confirmed by the Senate on January 8th, 2008. Uh, as an attorney, uh, Commissioner Howard comes to the post with 15 years of policy experience at the state and federal levels. Uh, she has expertise in the areas of children and family issues, women's health, hospital and physician regulation, health programs for vulnerable populations, and efforts to expand health insurance coverage. Uh, she's also litigated health industry antitrust matters. Uh, of significant importance uh, as well, as she's the mother of a six-year-old, and uh, she likes chunky peanut butter. Um, we decided to just sort of add a little bit of stuff you're really interested in, right, as well. Um, I will next, oh, out of order here. I will next introduce Dr. Al Talia. 
um, who is the chair of the Department of Family Medicine here at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. So at some level, my boss as well. I have many bosses. Um, he uh, is a um, master educator here at UMDNJ, as well as a board certified family physician who founded the Health Policy Fellowship, and he chairs the strategic planning uh, group for Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Uh, this year, he has conceptualized and initiated the creation of the Robert Wood Johnson Partners, which is an integrated delivery system affiliated with the medical school that's just beginning to, uh, to get, get, get going. Um, he serves on the executive committee of the Washington-based Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, which is a coalition of payers, providers, and consumers in advancing health care reform. And uh, Dr. Talia is a native son, having grown up in Patterson, who now is experiencing great pride in the fact that Patterson is about to have its first national park. Next, we have um, Dr. Steve Wartman. In 2005, Dr. Wartman became the third president of the Association of Academic Health Centers, a nonprofit association based in Washington, D.C., that seeks to advance health and well-being through vigorous leadership of the nation's academic health centers. Prior to assuming this position, he was executive vice president for academic and health affairs and dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Dr. Wartman is a board certified internist, sociologist, and master of the American College of Physicians. He too has semi-New Jersey roots. He grew up in Philadelphia and spent many summers uh, down at the Jersey Shore. And finally, we have Dr. Joel Cantor, who is the director for the Center for State Health Policy and professor of public policy at Rutgers University uh, here in New Brunswick. Dr. Cantor's research focuses on issues of health care coverage, financing, and delivery, health care financing and delivery at the state and local levels. His work includes studies of health insurance market regulation, state health systems performance, access to care for low income and minority populations. Dr. Cantor is a tenured professor in the Blaustein School as well. And I guess the most important thing to say is Joel and I go way back doing a lot of work together in Healthier New Brunswick um, uh, 2010, where we really sought to translate sort of the academic side of what we think about into real community-based programs. And I have to admit, it was just a total pleasure working with you uh, in doing that. Never got to say that publicly before, so thank you. I'm also going to introduce uh, Dr. Elliot Fishman, because Commissioner Howard has to leave um, sort of at midpoint. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Fishman is going to, to take her place. So I will introduce him now so that the transition is seamless. Uh, Dr. Fishman was appointed Director of the Office of Policy in the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services in the summer of 2008. Prior to this appointment, he was a Vice President at Metropolitan Jewish Health System, a large integrated health system with a focus of care on the elderly and chronically ill in New York City. He's worked primarily on issues connected to long-term care, Medicaid, health information technology, and the quality of care, and he's published in Health Affairs and the Washington Post. Um, and I guess Dr. Fishman's other claim to fame is he is a colleague of Dr. Bruce Sladek, uh, and uh, who helped him come to us, if you will. Um, so as you can see, we have a very distinguished group of panelists, um, and I want you to uh, join me in welcoming them. And uh, we'll get ready to hear And I believe we will start with uh, Commissioner Howard. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for those. Um, those are the best introductions we've had in a while. We were joking before we started that it's always miserable to hear your, your, your bio um, recited ad, ad nauseum, and so it, people are probably much more interested in, wh in whether we prefer chunky or smooth peanut butter. So thank you, Denise, for enlightening us. The, um, I'm looking forward to this, and I want to thank Dr. Owen. This is an exciting week for you with your investiture yesterday. We're so excited about the leadership you brought to UMDNJ, and, and this is just um, one example of the new enthusiasm, and this is an exciting uh, opportunity to begin this conversation about health reform. And thank you, Dean Armenta, for hosting us. I always love coming to events here. So I'll just start by saying I'm very excited about the prospects for health care reform. And I think we're going to get into the details that really matter um, to New Jersey and to hospitals and academic institutions. And so I know not everyone shares that enthusiasm. I think a lot of people are afraid about reform. But I'm very excited. I think President Obama has made this an absolute priority. And I think it will get done this year. I think what's interesting is that he's focused on 
two prongs when he talks about reform. He talks about coverage, and there is absolutely, there's a focus on universal coverage, but he's also very attentive to talking about health care costs. I think he's very sensitive to the fact that 85% of us have health insurance, but those of us who do are struggling with costs, and, and that those costs are also really what is driving, in large part, our, our long-term deficits at the federal level. So this focus on costs is, I think, where all of the, um, uh, where the rub is, and I think we're going to get into an interesting discussion about how costs are going to be reined in, and I have a few thoughts about that. But I also wanted to say that I think what's exciting about not only the momentum in President Obama's focus is really this leadership team that he has assembled in Washington to focus on health reform is, is an excellent team from Secretary Sebelius to the new heads of CDC and the FDA and the folks at the White House that he has focusing on this. So um, I, I like to think that there's an, a, a perfect storm, an alignment of the stars to get health reform done this year. Now, what does it mean for New Jersey? I think Joel's going to talk more about this, but something I've been very focused on, and, I've, and I know many of our hospitals are focused on, is when President Obama talks about squeezing out inefficiencies to pay for health reform, what does that mean? I think we know that we are not as efficient as we could be, and Joel's going to talk about the Dartmouth Atlas data and the concerns that those raise. So when all of us as policymakers, we agree that we have inefficiencies, we need to squeeze those out, we need to prevent readmissions, um, we, need to, we probably need to move to, to payment reform that bundles payments and aligns incentives between hospitals and doctors. Those are all um, policy ideas that make sense on a macro level, but what do those mean for New Jersey? And I, I think it's very important to have this conversation because um, we may not be as well positioned as we would like to be uh, given some of the inefficiencies we have in our system. So I hope today we will have some good ideas about how we can improve our systems. I know this is something Dr. Talia here has been thinking a lot about, how do we improve our systems? So I'm very interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say about that. But really what I wanted to talk about was the importance of public health and health reform. And I think there's not enough discussion of public health and health reform. I was down in Washington about a month ago testifying before Congressman Pallone's committee and on this very issue. And it was so great that there was finally a focus on public health. We um, spend less than 2% of our health care dollars on public health. Yet, and this is a statistic I love to give, we know that 85% of the gains we've made in life expectancy over the last 100 years have been due to public health. So that includes things like vaccines, clean air and clean water, um, a number, all of the different public health uh, um, initiatives that many of us undertake, the Department of Health and Senior Services, but that aren't as sexy as um, some of the health systems reforms that we talk about. So public health, and I think now the public is beginning to realize the importance of public health with the development of the H1N1, or swine flu, more commonly known as swine flu. Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times had an excellent op-ed a couple weeks ago about saying that the 47 million uninsured are the typhoid Marys, are the walking typhoid Marys of our system. We know that the uninsured, we, we, the uninsured are more likely to contract H1N1 or less likely to have a flu vaccine. We hopefully will have an H1N1 vaccine this fall, but the uninsured are less likely to get it. And, um, they're probably also less likely to stay home from work financially. So uh, it was yet one more reminder about why health insurance matters, um, this, this, this outbreak of H1N1. And so I think this importance of public health was brought to bear yet again recently just in the context of H1N1. It was another reminder of how we need to focus on population-based interventions um, to improve our, the health of our communities. But I think that's it. I think we want us to keep short, so I'll turn it over. But thank you for letting me this opportunity, give me, allowing me this opportunity. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Stout? Denise, uh, thank you. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here. And, and Dr. Owen, on behalf of all the faculty here at Robert Wood Johnson, I want to congratulate you on your investiture. It's two years too late uh, in terms of congratulating you, but you know you're probably used to delayed gratification at this point anyway. Um, and Dr. Amenta, thank you again for hosting this. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. So healthcare reform in the Academic Health Center. Uh, well, the missions of the Academic Health Center have usually included education, research, and service. And here at Robert Wood, we also have that additional mission, community health. So what will healthcare reform mean for the missions of the Academic Health Center broadly and for UMDNJ specifically? Well, I think we've got to start by remembering uh, we're talking about healthcare reform uh, because we've got some problems to solve as a society. Uh, and three of the most pressing problems in American healthcare right now are as follows. Number one, the disgrace of over 47 million uninsured Americans, meaning that people have to choose on a daily basis between health care and other vital needs of life, such as housing, food, clothing, etc. 
Number two, the disgrace of health disparities among different populations, particularly minorities and poor, whose mortality and morbidity burdens in many instances far exceed majority populations. And thirdly, the lack of valuing primary care by the healthcare system and the resulting workforce imbalances with consequences of skyrocketing costs and poor quality in health care. And we experience all of those here in New Jersey. But if a reform addresses these three basic problems in American health care, it will be viewed as a success by the majority of people. Now reform, if it comes, and I have to tell you the people I speak to in Washington give it only a 40 percent chance of success by any measure, is the reform is likely to be incremental. Um, so what does it mean for the academic health center? It means change and change fundamentally in some of the revenue streams that have financed our activities. However, I see great opportunity in each of the problems that I've mentioned for academic health centers. I'd like to propose that if we are nimble and flexible as a public university, we can begin to take advantage of reform by addressing the contemporary problems seen here in our local state environment by utilizing the strengths of our scientific enterprise. I personally believe that the biggest opportunity in reform for academic, uh, academic health centers will be in the creation and what are called accountable care organizations, basically integrated delivery systems that could tie the needs of populations to the missions, mission areas of the enterprise of academic health centers to solve America's contemporary health problems. More on that in a little bit. Great. Thank you. Next, we'll turn to Dr. Wortman. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Owen and Dr. Rogers for the invitation. I'm very flattered to be here today, and congratulations on your investiture, Dr. Owen. It's a privilege for me to be here with you. Um, you know, if, sitting in Washington, you get an interesting view of the world and uh, the administration, and, and President Obama has made it very clear that, that access, the cost, access, and quality are the three main drivers of health reform in that order. And uh, what is missing from uh, that equation and which has not gotten sufficient attention in our opinion and in my opinion is the role of academic health centers in health reform very silent on that and we're trying to do a lot about that and secondly the role of the health workforce in health reform so I want to take a minute and talk about each of those two components very briefly and would love your opinions on some of the things that I'm about to say over the past 40 or 50 years um, the model that has evolved in the academic health center world has been to bring together the clinical side and the academic side to bring together the clinical practice with teaching and education and research. And if you study it even more closely, you very quickly find out that what is supporting the research and education missions often is the revenue from the clinical side. And that's the model that has evolved over about 40 years. I like to think of it as the virtuous cycle because it's my opinion and I think is held by a lot of thought leaders that investing clinical revenue into the academic side raises the level of the academic side, which in turn raises the level of the clinical side in so-called a virtuous cycle. And I don't think there's been a lot of thought given to health reform and the changes in, in the cost structure that are going to come down as a result of that on this particular virtuous cycle that we have evolved over 40 years. And I can tell you that um, uh, my organization is looking very much internationally and we're discovering that many countries around the world and many institutions around the world want to move toward a more virtuous cycle. And uh, they asked me what's going to happen with health reform and that in the United States because you have the premier academic health centers. And my answer is, to date, I don't know for sure. So that's point one. Point two has to do with the health workforce. Who is going to do the job of taking care of patients in a reformed health system? How do we know we're going to have the right kinds and types and geographic locations of practitioners to deliver the cost-effective quality of care to people that President Obama would like to do? Especially if we have increased access to care, who are the practitioners that are going to take care of them? We saw in Massachusetts a little bit of a problem when all of a sudden access was increased and there were shortages of primary care physicians, for example. So we're very, very concerned with the health workforce issue. We don't have a national policy for health workforce development and structure, and in fact, we don't even have a denominator for the equation of how many workforce people we need to deliver the quality care in a reformed health care system. We need more, but I would ask you, if we need more, what is it that we need them to do? And that's a question that we're looking to answer 
uh, as best we can in the next few months. And finally, Dr. Cantor. Okay. Well, since we're uh, uh, handicapping the likelihood of health reform, I guess I have to weigh in on that a little bit. I guess I'm in between um, Commissioner Howard and uh, Dr. Talia. It's somewhere between 40 percent and almost certain. <laughs> Um, I'm not as jaded as your Washington colleagues, but I would say that uh, it's, it's my view that, that this administration is, uh, uh, on, on the politics side, much more savvy in handling the issues uh, uh, that makes it, I think, somewhat more likely that there'll be some serious health reform uh, this year than prior administrations, and I'm not just talking about the, uh, the Clinton plan, but going way back, even the Nixon plan. Um, uh, there's a long history of failure here. Um, but why, why are they, uh, uh, what are they grabbing onto that makes me think they're going to be more successful? Well, you just have to look at the polls published by the Kaiser Family Foundation and others that make it very clear that people, the, pop, the public is deeply worried about the cost and what the cost is going to do um, to their ability to get the care they need. Um, so the Obama administration is not leading with the coverage issue, and we all know there's a very serious coverage issue but we're talking about cost. I think this does enhance the likelihood uh, that uh, reform will succeed, but it also dramatically increases the likelihood that academic health centers and other providers are going to feel some pain as cost containment measures are put into place. And again, unlike earlier renditions of uh, cost containment in health reform, nobody's talking about goal, uh, um, caps and rationing and, and limits and expenditure targets, they're, they're talking about improving quality, improving effectiveness, and reducing uh, wasteful and, uh, care and care of uh, marginal value. Well, you know, you reduce anybody's care uh, and somebody's going to lose income, there'll be a lot of pushback. But I think that's where, they, that's where the policy action is going to be. So, you know, we hear about other things like health information technology, uh, which, you know, even the Congressional Budget Office says will yield some savings, but, but only in the very long run. And as John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So, um, but I think where the real action will be uh, in the short run, if they are politically successful, is in payment reform, and others have alluded to this as well. So I think we are likely to see increases in payment to pr for primary care, for primary care physicians, but it will probably be at the expense of specialty care. Uh, we're likely to see pay for performance, value-based payment systems that encourage the so-called uh, medical homes, in encourages uh, medical error reduction, encourages um, use, better use of clinical preventive services, which we uh, underutilize in this country. Uh, it's also likely to reduce payment for what is seen as excessive resource utilization. So, for example, we're already talking about uh, penal, financially penalizing 30-day uh, readmissions, readmissions within 30 days for conditions like heart failure. Um, talking about episode of care payment where we bundle uh, pre-hospital hospitalization and post-hospital care and, importantly, the hospital fee along with the physician fee. Uh, it's very complex, but there's a lot of movement uh, on some of these uh, concepts, and I think this is where health reform is going to start uh, in this round, if it starts at all. So uh, I think these strategies raise some really very serious challenges for academic health centers, both in their teaching roles and in their patient care roles. Uh, and frankly, I think New Jersey's academic health centers are going to feel more challenge here uh, than others, and here's where I'll bring out some of the Dartmouth Atlas data. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you dig in and look. The folks at uh, Dartmouth Medical School do a lot of analysis of Medicare data. So these are people who all have health insurance, at least to some degree, uh, and of course it's seniors, so there's a lot of need for health care. Um, they have created something called the Hospital Care Intensity Index, and while in we in New Jersey like being number one. It's unfortunate that we're number one on this index because they rate us as the most, having the most aggressive medical practice patterns in the nation. I'll pull out just a few examples, and here I'm going to focus on New Brunswick, that's where we are, but also Newark and Camden because that's where other AMCs are. So these are for Medicare patients with chronic illnesses in their last two years of life. 
So on average, our patients in those three catchment areas of our three academic medical centers um, receive about twice as many ICU days as the national average, uh, intensive care unit days um, than uh, patients nationally, uh, and they have about three times as many uh, consults or visits uh, with specialty care uh, physicians. Now, you're probably thinking, and these are natural hypotheses, uh, that, well, we may have a more highly acutely ill population, or maybe this is just the cost of doing business when we're training the next generation of uh, physicians, but I don't think those hypotheses uh, hold water. Um, for example, um, our, our medical specialty uh, visits for Medicare patients, again, in the last two years of life, are 1.7 times higher than the, is the case for patients in Manhattan, and over three times higher than patients in Boston. And last I checked, they have um, academic medical centers in those places. In fact, they have too many academic, one might argue, sorry, <laughs> that they may have too many. Um, now, okay, the, the next natural hypothesis is we're just doing a better job with our patients. They really need that care. And as if um, I needed help making this point, in today's issue of health affairs, there's an article called Hospital Quality and Intensity of Spending. Is there an association? So they, again, looked at this. This is the Dartmouth folks. They looked at the last two years of life for chronically ill Medicare patients, same population, and they examine care across all of the nation's hospitals, and they find no association between process quality, granted it's only process measures, and more spending. Except in academic medical centers, where for, at least for some indicators, they find more spendings associated with worse quality. So I think it's hard to make the case that it's the patient population, it's hard to make the case that it's a cost of doing teaching, and so far it's hard to make the case uh, that it's about uh, doing better for our patients, for your patients. I guess I'm not allowed to see patients. <laughs> um, students, I have students. Okay. So of course the other goal uh, in uh, national health reform will be covering uh, the uninsured, moving us closer to universal coverage. Um, and again, if this uh, comes to pass, I think New Jersey's academic health centers uh, will face more than the usual challenges uh, in this regard. And here I'll cite the study that uh, Dr. Rogers mentioned that we, I had the pleasure of working with her on here in New Brunswick. And in 2002, we conducted a comprehensive health assessment that included a population-based survey of local New Brunswick residents. So remember, we have three times as many medical specialty visits as here as, as patients in Boston. But in our study, uh, among patients who self-identified uh, as needing specialty care, so either a physician told them they needed it, Chandler Health Center told them they needed it, uh, or they perceived the need uh, for whatever reason, 43% of those residents, of those who think they need specialty care, say that it's hard to get, that it's somewhat or very difficult to get that care. Now, when you look at the uninsured, 78% say, uh, with self-identified specialty care needs, say it's uh, somewhat or very difficult to get that care. Okay, so it's self-reported, so maybe it's not 80%, maybe it's only 40%. Still, um, I think this points out the skewness of our systems here, the skewness of the way we're training people, the skewness of how we're paying people, uh, and uh, the skewness of the whole health system that health reform purportedly uh, is going to try to address. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have a question for each of you. Um, and so I'd like to get your response to my question, but I would offer that others on the panel, if you have something to add, uh, please feel free to chime in. I certainly want to make this somewhat uh, interactive. And because, Commissioner Howard, you're going to have to leave us a little early, I'll start with you. And the question I have for you is, what do you think the role of state government is, if any, in shifting the focus from to preventive care um, and increasing um, a focus on public health? And uh, if there is such a role, how do you see this could be done? And particularly um, in New Jersey, uh, what's your sense of how we might be able to do this? Thank you. That's a great question. I think that in two ways. One, the state is, of course, a payer. 
um, and we're, we're a, a payer of, uh, uh, for health care in a number of ways, one through the Medicaid program. So we have over a million lives through the Medicaid program and then through the state employee health benefit program. So we have a lot of skin in the game on health care. And are we putting our money in the right way? Are we valuing, for example, uh, primary care? No, probably not. We know in, in New Jersey in particular that we are one of the lowest reimbursers of um, of physician um, for under Medicaid. So, and it's particularly bad, that disparity in primary care. So one, we could do a better job probably if our finances were better in, in how we do as a payer and and we could probably innovate more in terms of how we pay and some of Dr. Talia's ideas about creating the patient center medical home, you know, we could, we could um, pilot some of those projects as payers. So I think we shouldn't forget that we are a payer and a consumer. There's also, of course, our role as a regulator and as a, as a, a provider of, of services and that's another area where unfortunately the economic downturn limits our ability to maybe be as creative as we'd want to be but as I mentioned earlier all these public health advancements that have been so important to general public health many of them have been as a result of state actions the things we do when we're in on food safety for example what we've seen earlier this year um, with the salmonella in, in peanuts, we saw that that was really a breakdown at state level, thankfully not in New Jersey, but really a, a breakdown of state public health systems because of starving of public health over the years because of state budget problems. So a number of these problems, unfortunately, um, we can see the answers, but we can't necessarily get there in this climate. But I think there are a couple ways in which the state can play an important role. Can I, can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. Let me just ask the commissioner a question, if I may. If the state is successful in bringing about these reimbursement and regulatory reforms, do you have the health workforce competently trained, adequate numbers to carry out those reforms? No, we don't. I think that was a, I'm so glad you raised that when you spoke earlier to talk about not only do we not, I'm not even sure we have the best handle on what the needs are. And, and so one role we, we could play um, if we were properly resourced would probably be to do in sort of in a health planning capacity to be talking about what do we need not just on the physician front but in nursing and other health professionals and doing that side of sort of planning and then coordinating with our partners. Any other questions or comments? Good. Dr. Talia, um, back in 1961 or so, Carl White did a, um, a study looking at the ecology of medical care that really demonstrated the very skewed population of patients who come to academic health centers and get their care in academic health centers. Um, as you know, Larry Green, a uh, family physician, updated that uh, probably now, about 10 years ago, um, published it in the New England Journal of Medicine and actually showed that the skew continues, um, that indeed the vast majority of people uh, out in the world are thankfully healthy, so don't much enter into our, our walls at all. And that subset of the population that enters into an academic health center is really quite skewed compared to the general population. Given that, um, what role can and should academic health centers play in changing how healthcare is delivered, um, but also what does that mean in terms of how we train future providers? Well, I think you've articulated it very, very well. I mean, the reality is, uh, if you think about, if you were visiting from Mars and you stopped, you know, <laughs> dropped down here into New Jersey and looked at medical education around the country, um, we actually give students a very, very small slice of the total healthcare environment uh, that they that they experience as medical students. Um, I think that's, a, you know, picking up on what the opportunities are. I think that's a huge opportunity. Now, here at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, we, we've done a lot to try to get students out into communities. And I mentioned earlier that I think one of the great opportunities for the academic health centers around the country, and indeed it's happening in a number of them as we speak, is really to take a look at the population needs within communities and figure out how they can solve those contemporary problems that they see in their local community. And we can define local community here, in New, here as New Jersey, as an example. So giving our students th uh, educational opportunities to see the full spectrum of wellness and illness behavior in, in the population I think is going to be very, very important as, the, as health reform uh, takes shape. I think it also has an important role for discovery. Uh, if you think about academic health centers' missions, again, I think one, the one I worry about most in terms of health care reform is what's going to happen to this, the discovery mission. Um, because with all the concerns, as long as, as long as the discussion is just about cost containment, 
uh, I think we run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. I think we need to be cognizant that our academic health centers have contrib contributed in huge ways uh, to the discovery process around illness. I think the opportunity exists for them also to contribute around uh, community population needs as well, uh, and I think that's a, an opportunity for the future. Can I comment on that too? Absolutely. Please. Um, I, first of all, I thought that um, New Jersey had visitors from Mars in 1938. <laughs> So, am I right about that? Right. But they left. Okay. Um, and um, Carl White who, uh, was my mentor at Hopkins, and I have great respect for that study and learned from him directly. You know, one of the big problems here is that um, uh, the funding of, of graduate medical education, which is a multi-billion dollar enterprise, when the decision was made and the legislation was passed in 1965, the money went to hospitals, which was probably appropriate looking at it from 1965. So if the hospitals are paying for residents, and there are all kinds of rules, some arcane, some not so arcane, about where they can be reimbursed when you train them. It's very difficult to give residents often the kind of community-based focus that Dr. White and yourselves would like to have. And that's been a hot-button issue for years, what, what to do about graduate medical education. We don't need to get into that today because there's a lot of money tied up in it and a lot of hospital welfare is tied up in, in terms of uh, fiscal viability. But I think that's one of the great difficulties we have to overcome. Um, well, actually, we are going to get into it a little bit today because that's the very question I was about to ask you next, um, which really has to do with just health care reform and how it will potentially shift the economic basis upon which most academic health centers today survive. So if we look at um, a shift from treating illness to preventing disease and maintaining health, and if we anticipate there may be a change, a move away from having Medicare be the primary mechanisms that we use to pay for the training of future physicians, um, A, what do you see as a uh, potential uh, result of this, and B, what would you anticipate would be some solutions uh, to this problem? Well, I think it will, put, it will put great strain on the virtuous cycle that I described earlier, the 40 years of, of, of transfer of funds between the academic and clinical sides, the back and forth and so forth. Um, I think um, if reform is successful and it's at a pace that's a little bit less than incremental but, you know, not too uh, horrendous, we'll see fundamental changes in both the models of education of health professionals and in the practice patterns. Um, and I think that uh, this is something that's needed. I mean, I go around the country saying, you know, it's not just about doctors when you talk about health reform. And we tend just to talk about doctors. It's not just about doctors. It's about every member of the potentially new healthcare team. That's very, very exciting. We have millions of health professionals out there who have their own licensing and accreditation and rules of regulation and scopes of practice and reimbursement systems and whatever, but there really is no cohesive way often, except in some very highly specialized units, where they can work together as a team. And where everybody now agrees that in the era of genomic medicine and chronic disease management, team care is going to be important. I think that the kind of changes that uh, may come down in health reform will be a great catalyst for overcoming the huge barriers that we've had to team care in actual clinical practice and in interprofessional education. Could I follow up on that? Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Wortman, though, wouldn't you agree that academic health centers are in many ways best positioned to bring about that integration? They, many of them are involved in health professional education across the entire spectrum of uh, the professions. Um, many of them have connections to community, either through primary care networks or other uh, types of, uh, of uh, community-based uh, linkages. Uh, and most of them are nonprofit, uh, so that they, have, uh, they have skin in the game, so to speak, but they, uh, they aren't there to rip off the system. Uh, so doesn't that put academic health centers in the best position, really, to take a leadership role in health care reform? My very message to the White House next week. Thank you. <laughs> if, I could, if I could just Please add, yes. and this is, you know, I mean, it's, if, if, if you were this uh, Martian visitor uh, and you looked at our, um, our payment system, you would predict that we have exactly what we have. Well, we have too many visits of certain kinds because that's what we pay for. We don't pay for team care. Uh, we don't pay for... Uh, 
different health professions working together so it doesn't happen. And, and um, yes, <coughs> academic health centers have a huge role to play here. I completely agree with that. But right now that role is Sisyphusian and you're rolling the rock up the reimbursement hill. And, and so hopefully that's what will change. So for you, Joel, I'd like uh, to ask the question of, you know, a lot of what we are talking about, as you described, is really payment reform. And the question really is, is payment reform enough to get us where we need to go, and particularly around issues related to quality of care? So as you look at some of the proposals, do you really anticipate that it's going to do what we need to have done in this country in terms of really improving significantly the quality of care that gets delivered to patients? Well, I think in my heart of hearts, I believe that when you have them by the reimbursement, their hearts and minds will follow, but you also need the science. And um, I think there's been a systematic uh, underinvestment uh, in uh, the, the science of understanding uh, what works and what's most cost effective. And there's a, a, another leg of the, the uh, health reform stool is something called comparative effectiveness research. There was a lot of money for that in the and the stimulus plan, and uh, uh, it's a fairly controversial issue, uh, but uh, the, the idea is to in invest in head-to-head -head studies of different medical technologies looking at uh, outcomes, first and foremost. Very controversial whether you also look at costs, but even outcomes, I think, uh, would be a hu huge uh, step forward. Uh, so you need the scientific basis. Uh, right now, investment in biomedical research is quite substantial and it's terrific, but it's, it's the clinical trial. It's the, you know, de demonstrating that things work in the laboratory. It's not uh, asking the question how do things work on the ground in reality when it's actually prescribed to real people. So I think comparative effectiveness research is one uh, area. Uh, that, that can contribute to improved quality of care and cost-effective care. But there's also other things, I believe, that, that need to be done and that are being talked about actively about performance measurement and publication. And there's some evidence that this is already having uh, some effect. Obviously, we have to improve the measures and be much more out outcome-oriented and possibly even linking, uh, eventually, uh, payment to, to performance, and there's so far not much evidence that that does much good, but uh, there's still a lot of, lot of hope in that. Um, I'd like to shock people a little bit if I could, if that's with your permission. Oh, please. Um, would I shock you if I said I don't think the health system is failing? Is there anybody who would disagree with that comment? Or you don't want to raise your hand? I don't think the health system is failing. Oh, I do. And, and let me tell you why I don't think, this is just for the purpose of shocking people. Um, <laughs> And the reason I don't think it is, is if you subscribe to the theory that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets, then the health system is working really, really well. Because what it's designed to achieve is wealth, not health. Only one letter difference, by the way, the H and the W. We have, we have created enormous wealth in the health system. Where there happens to be, coincidentally, a nexus of health and wealth, like, for example, let's pick the field of cardiology you have that nexus of health and wealth, you get great public health statistics. Everybody knows the, the good rates in, in the cardiologic diseases and cardiovascular diseases. Where you don't have the nexus of health and wealth, we have abysmal health statistics and so forth. So somehow, if we're going to get a reformed health system, we've got to make the goal of the reformed health system the H and not the W. And I think that's a huge challenge for the American psyche. I would say it's even got to go beyond the H, it's got to go to the P, which is the patient. And patients come in all different sizes and shapes. One of the concerns I have about health reform is it'll be good for the vanillas, but it's the exotic flavors that we might have some trouble with. Uh, folks with disabilities, folks who, kids, I mean, they're, who are on welfare. I mean, there's a whole host of folks that I think um, I have concerns about what, what health care reform will, will do. But to the degree that it, 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 it solves the problems that I mentioned earlier, I think we'll be a, a far better place than we are right now. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so a question for all of you, um, no one in specific, specifically, is um, how should we address this issue of coverage for undocumented workers and their families in this country? I think our time is up, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, you want me to look ready? Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the benefits of tenure. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, there have been a couple of experiments around the country that have, that have sought to do that. I'll, I'll use San Antonio, where you were, Dr. Woodman, as an example, um, where you don't necessarily need to have a green card or a uh, visa or a, a, pa a passport. You need to have a place of residence. Uh, and the place of residence essentially becomes the, um, the uh, proxy for uh, access. And um, Unfortunately, uh, that process of ensuring or at least providing a system that covers uh, people, including undocumented uh, folks, uh, involved the T word, uh, which otherwise is known as taxes. Uh, and the way they did that uh, in uh, the San Antonio area is um, by use of the dreaded P word, property tax, <laughs> and uh, hence uh, end the discussion in New Jersey. Yeah, well, that's true. Oh, Elliot, you're. Yes. So I'd make two comments about that. The first is just to take note of how much is already in place in New Jersey um, that is not true of most other states that supports care, uh, not only for undocumented immigrants, but for uninsured patients in general, both uh, in terms of inpatient and outpatient care at hospitals through the charity care program. We also have charity care funding that's going to federally qualified health centers. Um, I think that, uh, and I can say this, partly being relatively new to New Jersey, we tend to take for granted that those programs are uh, unusual and progressive, and, and we should recognize them. Uh, but the, the other key point is that I, really you're not going to get a solution to um, getting full access to care, mainstream access to care for undocumented immigrants until you get a broader mainstreaming of undocumented immigrants, right? I mean, that, that's it's hard to deal with the health care problem in isolation from the broader policy problem. I would add, and I, I, I certainly agree with what's been said, is that no matter what happens with health reform, even if we achieve anything close to universal coverage, I think ultimately for that population we're talking about a, the need to sustain a real safety net. And by that I mean institutions that care for anybody who walks in or gets rolled in the door uh, regardless of what kind of card they're carrying and, and that that gets paid for somehow. And we've kind of done that, not enough, New Jersey more than others, uh, but that's going to be um, a necessity within the system. So we can't do away with charity care after the day we get universal coverage. Uh, uh, my other point is that uh, we, we, you know, this is a very politically charged issue, the undocumented, uh, but even those immigrants who are here legally have terrible access to coverage. Um, and some states like New Jersey do, do better, um, but even those who have the legal access or entitlement to coverage are much less likely to sign up. And we've been erecting barriers to care for those people or not bringing down barriers such as language barriers nearly enough. So. That's not really a big part of the conversation in Washington these days because it is politically divisive, but it ultimately has to be. Thank you. Um, the last question I have before I'll open this up to our audience for questions is um, what is going to happen to both mental health care as well as dental care as we talk about uh, health care reform and is there some special role that academic health centers should play as we address those challenges as well? Ah, uh, the great Cartesian dualism. Whoever thought Descartes was dead, it's not true. Uh, the mind and body are separated, at least in healthcare, uh, which is a huge mistake. Uh, I think uh, to the degree that I hear healthcare reform being talked about in Washington and other places, a thing, another disturbing thing for me is that there's no mention of including behavioral health as part of, of a solution. And uh, right now, uh, you can ac have access to uh, behavioral health uh, inpatient services, and everybody gets cured in 22 days, is it? Or is it 28 days? Where is it, Chris? <laughs> Chris? You know, it's, it's, it's uh, whatever the limit is, and remarkably. Uh, and uh, there's been a complete disconnect uh, between primary care and behavioral health. Uh, we've tried to, a number of experiments here at Robert Wood to, to solve that, um, but I have to tell you until uh, the, the health system uh, embraces uh, change uh, and 
really sees uh, primary care as an ally in uh, the issues of behavioral health. Uh, I don't, and that, by that I mean reimbursing um, primary care for providing a large part of what happens at the uh, behavioral health side. I don't see a very good, very good outcome. I mean, I would uh, strongly agree with that. Um, I think that uh, if I can speak for uh, the the. Uh, mental health unit in our Department of Human Services. I know that uh, Kevin Martone, who actually is now the, the Deputy Commissioner for Human Services, has, has talked about that kind of integration on numerous occasions, and he has cited a statistic that um, life expectancy among people with diagnosed mental illnesses is about 25 years less than average life expectancy. So um, even if uh, one didn't care at all about mental health per se, uh, it has major physical health implications uh, and um, as uh, many people here can testify, it has major, the, the uh, lack of sufficient community uh, mental health capacity has uh, significant financial and policy implications and resource implications for hospitals and particularly academic medical centers uh, who, who are on the, the front lines of dealing with the lack of sufficient community mental health capacity in, in their emergency departments. Um, and uh, so that's, that's identification of a problem. I, the other comment that I'd make is just from a, a state perspective, uh, I, I do not know of any state that is looked to by other states as having gotten this right, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, there, uh, and I'm not aware, and I'd love to learn more about it, of, of international comparisons where we can look to, you know, this is a, a problem uh, in search of a model solution. I would, uh, I would also add, I mean, I certainly agree with everything that's been said here, uh, but I would also add, given the topic of, of this panel, that it's the nexus of the mental, mental health services and the medical health services that has become one of the big balls and chains on academic health centers and others. Um, it's pay, if you look at who the charity care population is, uh, if you look at the people who go to the emergency department 8, 10, 12 times a year, um, they're people who have chronic illnesses, both medical and uh, mental illnesses. Um, who have a really hard time managing um, those conditions. There's some wonderful things going on. I'll mention Jeff Brenner at, uh, uh, in family medicine, uh, who runs a wonderful program in Camden that is uh, what I would call community organizing around these high-flying, frequent-flying, um, uh, frequent users of the hospitals uh, uh, down there, and they're having remarkable outcomes and making, making the patients' lives better. Uh, but they have to run that program with grants and, and you know, hat in hand because it doesn't get, doesn't get paid for. So we have to figure out how to make those kinds of programs mainstreamed, and we haven't done that yet. Uh, I feel compelled, actually, on behalf of uh, the dean of our dental school, who would shoot me if I didn't talk some more about teeth, um, th that that's the other dichotomy we have. Right. I mean, you know, not only do we separate the mind and the body, we separate the body from its teeth. And um, I, I think that certainly some of the research that's going on in our own, in our very own dental school, is actually demonstrating the interconnectedness between physical health and oral health. And I think we're going to have to grapple with that one as well. Just one more thing to have to figure out how to pay for. On that note, I'm going to move over to the podium so that I can take questions from the audience. And uh, give me just. Got, um, you got, okay, good. So we've got. Uh, I have a uh, question. Well, first of all, just to let you know, I live in Grover's Mill, where they landed, <laughs> and I you got survived. my eye on a couple of the neighbors. <laughs> uh, somebody mentioned uh, workforce, uh, and I, it's one of the things I have to worry about as dean of the medical school, and some of that relies on the fact that student debt is uh, reaching record highs. And it's not so much that people don't want to come into an academic health center to work, but they simply can't afford it. Uh, the pressures to go into private practice and to uh, generate 
their living is, uh, I think, putting us in great risk. In addition, um, I think the virtuous cycle is under attack, too. If, if we lose the clinical revenue, which is at least 50 or 60 percent of what we can feed the rest of our system with, then our abilities to maintain the basic sciences is going to be diminished, and less people are going to be able to come into the basic sciences. So I, I think there's a, a real issue here as far as not just workforce nationally, but who's going to maintain. If you're right, if what Al said about the uh, academic health centers being the solution to many of these problems, we're under great attack from the position of who we're going to have to work here. I, I, I think you're right on. Right on. I mean, I, when I talked about the virtuous cycle, let's remember we've had 40 years of that kind of development, which is blending the clinical and academic missions together and the income streams together. And what we've built up is the world's greatest academic health center enterprise. And I know this because I've traveled extensively the last few years, and countries want to emul emulate this. They don't have it in their own. In That's what we've built with that investment and with, it, with the kind of health system that we have as flawed as it is. So we have to be very careful going forward that we don't dismantle that. And that's one of the messages that I'm sort of delivering uh, to the White House. Now, we have called for a national commission to look at workforce and trying to get some rationality to the workforce, all the workforce, not just physicians. <clears throat> and then I'm always asked the question, with student debt <clears throat> being what it is, do you, have a, do you have an issue with students having free choice of what fields they want to go in, into? And my answer is, I cannot in good conscience look a student in the eye who owes $150,000 and say, you're restricted in your choice. So either we have to change the kinds of choices that they want to make or drastically change the way we do tuition. But I, I can completely concur with your comment. Yes, um, let me ask my colleague, Dr. Talia, though other people are willing to answer. I, I want to know about the stakeholder piece about the academic medical centers. Yes, it's true that we are the solution or can be a solution for the upcoming changes that the healthcare system needs. But on the other hand, following up on what was just said, and I'm a child of the 60s, and that, in that era it was the military industrial complex that we worried about. Well, nowadays it's the medical industrial complex that we worry about. Has about actually it has a larger piece of the GDP than we even had in the military in the 60s. Uh, so we really own the problem where we are. And any efforts to, to reform are going to be resisted by a lot of our academic colleagues and our academic centers. They're not going to be helped along with it. So how do we take a leadership position at this school, working with other academic centers, to move the dialogue away from keep it as, as it is to a change? Well, I, I would suggest that change is difficult, and it's not going to be an easy process. But I think within the university, within Robert Wood Johnson Medical spe specifically, we have a number of resources that a lot of other academic health centers don't necessarily have. For example, I, I, this sounds self-serving, but I'll say it anyway. I think we have a relatively strong family medicine department with really excellent ties to the community. We have a network of over 150 primary care practices that we, that we have direct ties to. In our, this is our research network, which could very easily be turned into a, uh, a network that goes beyond uh, just discovery, but also looks at patient care, education, the full integration, the full integrated delivery system piece that uh, I mentioned earlier. So, and I think every academic health center has pieces of those. So I think that to say that um, we would need to start from scratch would be wrong. And I think the other, the other piece is that, that um, if you look at health care reform in Washington right now, um, the, the interesting thing that the Obama administration is doing um, that was not done previously in, in efforts has been um, sort of the divide and conquer mentality in terms of the stakeholders uh, out there, uh, pitting subspecialists against primary care in terms of the physician community, um, in terms of the insurer community threatening a single payer system versus, uh, you know, a, the existing um, uh, insurer um, uh, system, telling hospitals that they're going to be uh, cut severely. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, stirring the pot that's going on right now with the hope that everybody will be fighting against each other and health care reform will probably slip through. Um, but but I, I think that, that 
academic health centers, if you look at the landscape, most of them, uh, as I said earlier, have excellent uh, liaisons with the professions. They have excellent liaisons with hospitals. They have excellent liaisons with the population. Um, granted, it's been a fairly narrow focus up until recently, but that's changing. So I think, again, academic health centers are in the best position to create integrated delivery systems to really, from the science side, really look at what the needs are um, from, and, and what the possible solutions and test some of those solutions in, in a systematic scientific fashion. Well, I, I, I want to give a little bit of a broader answer to a very astute question. Um, we all, everybody I know loves change and wants change unless it's to themselves. I mean, that's a fact. Um, and um, uh, in order to, to, to bring the kind of changes in the academic health center environment that are necessary, this is the task of leadership. And uh, I'm very much involved in leadership searches and getting a sense of what's going on and met all the leaders of our, na our nation's academic health centers. Leadership, the task of leadership today is much more difficult than it's ever been before because it's the task of integration and the task of alignment amongst all the functions of the academic health center. The silo-driven days are, are really going fast. Uh, individual schools, individual programs, individual this, individual management, et cetera, et cetera, is slowly passing toward an integrated, aligned structure. And that's going to facilitate, through leadership, the ability to meet these challenges. Got a question over here? My name is Michael Nagar. I'm a PGY3 in pathology. Um, I have a question based on some um, recent uh, speeches that I've heard by Healthcare for America Now and some other organizations. And they say, basically referring to what you were saying uh, before, that if tuition, and we owe $150,000 after medical school, and the fact that um, as a primary care physician you'd get paid less than a subspecialty, uh, more people have been going into subspecialties making a, uh, a vacancies for the primary cares. Uh, but what I wanted to ask was, will there be more money spent <coughs> toward the primary care fields and at the same time decreasing the salaries of the subspecialties? Um, this, is, this has been a concern of, uh, of many people since the president of Healthcare for America now actually basically said this. So uh, I was just curious about that. Um, what if, do you think? It, you know, the, where else are you going to get the money from? I guess that's the question people would ask in Washington. If you want to upgrade <coughs> primary care uh, physician salaries, if you want to upgrade uh, clinical nurse practitioners, a doctorate of nursing practices, folks in the allied health professions, uh, incentivize team care and do all these things, where, where's the money going to come from? And, it, 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 you know, that's the question everybody's asking. Will there be, you know, we've got two or three trillion dollars floating around now in a health system that's twice as much per capita as any other uh, country in the world uh, with not awfully good health statistics. Where is that money going to come from? If we can inject another trillion into the system, sure, everybody can be happy and be satisfied. But most folks who are realists and pragmatists say there has to be some change in the fundamental reimbursement mechanism to achieve that. There, I, I believe that um, just, just based on, on conversations with, with other folks, there's a lot of money wasted in the healthcare system. And if, we, if we're able to um, perhaps decrease the cost of billing, uh, going to our electronic medical records and um, that sort of thing, that might save some uh, significant money uh, to be able to afford um, let, me, let, me, let me address that because that's controversial. I think a lot of the waste currently are people's incomes. <clears throat> whether they're in the, uh, whatever field you're in, whether you're a subspecialist delivering care or whether you're in the medical technology field or in the medical device industry or big pharma or whatever your employment is, uh, a lot of what you do is considered by these so-called experts waste. So you are, in effect, by, by cutting the waste out of the system, changing people's incomes. That's true. I think the other uh, observation on this is uh, that um, it's, it's actually hard to squeeze out enough dollars from reducing uh, 
really the administrative waste. I mean, it's part of the reason our, our health care system costs at least 20 percent more than any other country on earth. But uh, you can squeeze it out a little bit over time, but it's not going to be the kind of dollars you need to do these to cover the uninsured, pay primary care more, encourage team care, and all those other things. It's just there's not, not enough money there. What a question, Dr. Bachman? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. Hi, my name is Kathleen Emmerich, and I work at the Center for Continuing Education at the North Campus. Um, I've been given a directive to initiate a performance improvement um, project, uh, and I don't know who used the word siloed, but that couldn't be more accurate. Um, I've been trying to leverage the resources of the Quality Improvement Department to find out what deficits um, you know, are incurring on the Newark campus um, so I could develop or we could develop a continuing education intervention um, to improve patient care. Um, so my suggestion would be to triangulate uh, the resources, the quality improvement department, and let us, you know, the, the continuing education department be one arm of Im helping improving patient care by developing uh, interventions. This would lead, actually, uh, what are your thoughts about sort of n not even so much continuing education, but how do we think differently about the continuing of ongoing education for healthcare professionals um, <laughs> as we move forward? You're looking at me. I, I, you know, I had a little role uh, at the National Board of Medical Examiners recently to, uh, to propose some changes uh, in the way we, uh, we uh, train our, our uh, certainly medical students. But I think to answer that, we're going to have to all learn how to play well in the sandbox together. Um, I, I, I think the si current siloed um, approach to health professions education has been recognized by no, no less than the IOM as, as a real problem in terms of getting to where we want to be in a healthcare system. So the challenge is, and I think again, looking at it from a research perspective, the opportunities are going to actually be in learning how to do that over time and figuring out what works best. I mean, we talk about increasing the, uh, the, the problem of primary care in New Jersey. Uh, a lot of folks in New Jersey deliver primary care in different professions. Um, I don't think we've necessarily learned how we play well together yet. Uh, and I think we're going to need to do that, uh, not only for ourselves, but most importantly for patients and the public. So I think, again, the I see that as opportunity for the Academic Health Center to lead in the process. And my hope is that we will. Again, I would just say that the two eyes, integration and alignment, are the keys to achieving those goals. Dr. Bachman, I am going to come back to you since I uh, blew it last time. Thank you. OBGYN, one of the issues that comes up in terms of cost is the legal costs of malpractice, litigation, uh, the fear that, for instance, in obstetrics, when we take care of a high-risk patient, that we're putting ourselves at risk. And this truly increases health care costs. What part of the equation do you see the legal system playing in health care reform? Can we divorce malpractice from health care delivery? Again, I'm sort of tempted to say our time is up. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, um, I agree that uh, medical liability is a big underlying component of our, our high health care costs, and to some degree, um, I think it does drive utilization patterns that are not, not optimal. Uh, but the research doesn't support the idea that it's a, one of the big drivers of, of the ever-increasing, um, you know, the steep slope of our health care cost increases. It's sort of always there. We have our periodic, periodic uh, malpractice crises where premiums go up radically. That has, that has more to do with the dysfunction of the malpractice insurance system uh, it has something to do with claims, too, but not, not nearly as much. So while it, I, I think it needs to be addressed, needs to be fixed, I think it's certainly one of the most divisive and uncomfortable issues for, for politicians uh, to deal with. It's a, it's a no-win situation uh, for them. So I'm not sure we're going to hear uh, a lot about it. And the kind of dichotomous approach that we hear with the um, the trial lawyers on, on the one hand saying you can't take away anyone's rights, 
you know, they've been harmed, they deserve this. And the uh, high-risk medical professions saying we've got to cap liability. And those are, with those are the only two options on the table, I, I think the conversation ends there. Um, and there are lots of other ideas out there for addressing these issues really as a fundamental quality issue. Um, there's some very interesting experiments, that, but um, I, I, I guess I don't, I agree with you, it's a, it's a huge issue. I don't see it changing in this round of health reform anyway. Dr. Like? Bob Like from Department of Family Medicine, Robert Wood Johnson Med School. The issue that I <clears throat> would be interested in panel members' reactions to is the subject of blind spots. And what I mean by that is an ophthalmologist many years ago shared what he thought to be a key question, which was, do I know what my blind spots are or where they are? And the blind spot that I'm interested in is the role of the community in health reform efforts as well as in their relationships to academic health centers. As we know, there have been historically town gown issues, often research and other decisions are made in the, by the quote experts and then diffuse out to the community and the research is done in the tertiary centers and comes out to the community. And yet if we've learned nothing more from uh, the recent elections, the growth of Web 2.0, learning communities, participatory efforts are really the expertise often lies within the communities. So I'm wondering, as you think ahead to, uh, from your vantage point, what is the role of community engagement in helping to inform and change things and show us where our blind spots are in academia, our blind spots in the health reform efforts? <laughs> Uh, disclosure, Bob is in my, de in my department, uh, he did not, I did, that was not a planted question. Um, but to answer your question, Bob, I think you're right, we do have blind spots within academic health centers and I think uh, as Denise pointed out earlier, some of them, uh, the, the presumption is that we're seeing the totality of health care a lot of times and a lot of what goes on in health care occurs in families, it occurs in other social units. It doesn't necessarily even involve uh, the academic health center or physicians or medical education. Having said that, I think it's very important for academic health centers to engage the community. Uh, we're engaged in an effort right now in our department to uh, transform what has been a basically community effort uh, in having to do with primary care practices into uh, an effort that will look at community-based participatory research. But you can't come in as the 300-pound gorilla and expect that communities are necessarily going to embrace you. A lot of the questions are, where the heck have you been for the last 35 years? Uh, so I think we've got a lot, of, a lot of relationship building that needs to happen with communities as academic health centers uh, that uh, will take some time and effort on both parts. So it's a process, but I think this is a perfect time to begin. I think there's a very slow but steady movement in that direction. Um, there's increasing recognition of the value and importance of the social determinants of, of health, which in fact in most studies that are, uh, as a sociologist I can speak to their quality, show that the variation in, in, in health is overall greater in the social determinants than it is with actual medical care delivered, which is a fact that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, what we're going to see moving is a direction is more toward uh, research in the community uh, and uh, practice, collaborative practice in the community, but it's going to require the development of a new kind of infrastructure at the academic health center, which as you know is mostly basic science rich and uh, traditionally clinical research risk uh, rich. Claire Pomeroy, the vice chancellor at UC Davis and myself have written a paper for the IOM on this very topic trying to point out how much infrastructure change would be necessary within the academic medical center complex to address the issues of community health and community well-being. It requires so many changes in what we do, uh, the development of new sorts of health professionals, uh, new types of researchers, uh, new streams of funding, a new criteria for promotion and tenure. There's a long, long list of things that need to be tackled, but I'm optimistic that we're going to be moving in that direction. Mr. Jones? very much. This is, a, uh, this is a great conversation. I, I appreciate this opportunity very much. I'd like to follow up on uh, Dr. Wortman's comment about that, the amount of change, and specifically ask uh, uh, Dr. Cantor what he's hearing about the implementation. I do believe now's the time. We need health care reform because we need to deal with access issues. We need a thoughtful way of addressing the cost. But what are you hearing from Washington about how the changes get implemented? 
Is something slammed in in January of next year? Is there a rollout period where demonstration projects or other things like that would be done? What specifically are you hearing about how reform might be implemented? I'm sorry that Heather Howard left because she's got the Capitol Hill experience uh, here. Um, I guess I agree with uh, earlier statements, I guess it was Dr. Talia, who said that we're likely to see this reform as being incremental, but I wouldn't confuse that with timidity. You know, I think that the, the aim is to move very fast before opposition can mount, which means this calendar year, hopefully in the minds of the administration by the fall, uh, to move forward with the, with the framework that gets then phased in uh, over, over time. Um, I think there's a lot of infrastructure change that would need to happen if anything close to their vision in, gets enacted. So I think there would have to be um, a, a fairly lengthy implementation period. I don't know if you want to. Well, let me just jump in here real quick. Um, one of the strategic differences between the Clinton and the Obama approach to health care reform is that President Obama is leaving uh, the legislation in the hands of the Senate. And may, largely in the Senate Finance Committee specifically, as opposed to the Clinton era where the legislation was largely drafted within the White House. That's a huge shift. And um, uh, Obama is, they're sort of, the White House is laying out the principles, but they're leaving it to the Senate and some of the other committees, a few in the House, to actually draft the legislation. Now is the time where this legislation is being written. The next few months are absolutely critical to get your input in uh, into Washington, uh, wherever opportunities you have, and that's why we're making an all-out push to get to get in and talk to them. That's where it's going to happen. The, the goal is to get it to get something drafted by August, which is very aggressive, and it's only at that point will we have an answer to your question of what it will actually look like in a meaningful way. I I would. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, just one. Uh, clue in terms of implementation is that quietly last week, uh, separate from the White, Ho White House's uh, Health Reform Office, which is really the, taking the lead on uh, getting the legislation through, there was an Office of Health Reform that was set up within the Department of Health and Human Services, which uh, is now led by Senator Daschle's former uh, health policy lead, Jean Lambrew. I think that's an indication of some of the thinking that's going on uh, within the Obama administration about how this is going to be implemented. And you note it's not part of uh, CMS. It's reporting in right to the secretary. Um, certainly, uh, you know, that's something to keep an eye on. Much of the Senate side of the legislation has already been written. Uh, it's interesting that the uh, House side is where a lot of the uh, um, scrap, uh, not the scrap, but the, the, uh, the uh, debates among different uh, uh, pieces of the legislation uh, are emerging. Um, it's also, uh, I'll point out, a Jersey affair. Um, three of the subcommittee chairs uh, that will be looking at legislation on the House side are actually from New Jersey. Uh, Bill Pascrell from, uh, from uh, Passaic County, uh, Bob Andrews from Camden County, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Pallone uh, from, uh, from the Jersey Shore area. So uh, whatever happens in Washington, it'll be New Jersey's fault. The gentleman over here. Uh, you want to get him there? Uh, like Dr. Dr. Lyke and Dr. Squee, I'm going to try to put Dr. Atalia. I'm sorry, I'm Yasser Solomon, uh, I'm a county physician. Uh, I'm going to try to put Dr. Atalia on the spot as well and put his feet to the fire a little bit. In the late 80s and early 90s, we made a big push and sold it to the medical students that we primary care was the way to go. They were the gatekeepers. Uh, they were going to solve the whole system and the whole problems. And we had a lot of medical students going to the primary care, myself being one of them. I enjoy very much. I, it's one of the best things I could have done. I had my training here. Talia and Dr. Spee and Dr. Leif were my mentors. Um, but I, I, we sort of lost heart a little bit and we lost our ways because we sold this to the to the students and the medical schools, but I think we've got to sell it to the, to the community and, 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 the, and the patients themselves. Patients didn't consider us the specialists in, in primary care. They said they were, we were the referral system for them to get to the subspecialists. 
and, and we forgot that very important point that, and maybe we didn't teach us the, the students themselves that, that when they came out and became physicians, primary care physicians, that they are indeed the specialists of the whole body and that they didn't need to use the self-specialist unless it's truly absolutely necessary. And we forgot that point, I believe. Uh, and, and, and what we've seen, and unlike, uh, contrary to Dr. Wortman, I'm not afraid to change. I, in fact, I had to change. Uh, I'm no longer full-time private practice anymore. I had to take a full-time position because private practice was not going the way I thought it should be and it needed to be. Uh, so therefore, I had to change, and I, and I enjoy what I do now very much. Uh, uh, so change is not an issue for, for primary care physicians. They need reimbursement, for one thing, and going back to the behavior health issue. Uh, when I came out from medical school and, and, I, and I did a lot of behavior health in, in practice, and in private practice, you have a lot of time early on. And you uh, spend an hour with the patient, and you bill the patient for a 3111, 311 depression, and you get an expectation benefit from the insurance company saying, you're not a psychiatrist, we're not going to pay you for this. And you couldn't fight it. Uh, so there's, there was a really... Uh, disconnect in what we were taught in medical school and, and in our training and what happened subsequently and we're not we don't seem to be going back to that to try to restructure that but rather make another different change for, for, for medical for let, let me let me jump in here because I think you raised a really interesting issue and one we need to think more about I think there's a tendency to put too much of the onus on on let's talk about physicians for a minute and not not the other professions just yet but let's look at the physician I think there's a tendency to put too much weight on the value and meaning of medical education in terms of influencing the outcome of what happens in the future. Um, I think it's all well, well said, but in reality, I think you're right that the tail and the dog, what's wagging what, is what is wagging things is what happens in practice. And, you know, when people get out in the real world and they get in an environment where they have to make a living, they want to be satisfied with what they do, they want to feel fulfilled and that they're successful in healing other people. You know, that's the environment that's going to determine what they do and how they do it, more so than what they necessarily learned in medical school. So I, I think that we, we can tinker around the edges of a medical school education and change things here and there, but what it really has to change is your, what, you, what I think you implied in your remarks, which is the actual practice itself. Dr. Seiden? Thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Seiden. I'm student affairs dean here at Robert Wood Johnson. Um, <clears throat> we're nationally, we're in sort of the early stages of a substantial expansion in the number of medical school graduates uh, that will probably finish off increasing about 30 percent uh, with existing schools already, many of them increasing their class size and about a half a dozen new medical schools in various stages of development. That's all happening while at the same time there's no apparent increase in graduate medical education uh, spots. So the, <clears throat> the result, <clears throat> excuse me, the result of that is already we're seeing a, a squeezing out of IMGs uh, for U.S. graduates in, in uh, graduate training. And even as early as this year, we've already nationally seen a substantial increase in the challenge of the residency match. Uh, but there's no increase in the health workforce as a result of all of this, which is the purported reason for the increase in class sizes. So my question is, in the face of no apparent source of funding for increasing GME, is the allocation of resources toward the increase of medical school class sizes and numbers of medical schools a productive use of resources? Um, let me, this is a great question because this is, this, is a, this is so many levels that we need to think about. It's not just an issue, well, we need more physicians, so we need to create more medical schools. That's too simplistic. One is, of course, the very important issue that uh, given the uh, percentage of GDP that's re that has to do with health and health care, everybody knows that medical schools and their associated research and clinical enterprises are great economic drivers for community development. It's a great business model. Uh, so it's not surprising that some folks from the chambers of commerces of these cities and towns have been su very supportive of doing that for economic development reasons. There's an argument on the self-sufficiency side that says that instead of taking individuals from countries that may need them more, uh, we ought to be growing our own. And, uh, and this is a good thing for self-sufficiency. There's a counter argument to that as well, by the way, which is the individual's right to better him or herself in, in, a, in a world where you can travel freely. And also the issue of, of, of what the practice uh, patterns will be of this 30 percent 
Um, I've heard a congressman say, or somebody, no, it was a staffer say in Washington, well, if you graduate 30% more doctors, uh, aren't you going to have 30% more doctors giving Botox injections? You know, and that kind of gives, gives it to you in a nutshell. It's a very interesting, multi-layered, multifaceted issue. As long as we maintain that cap on GME as it exists today, you're absolutely right. There will not be a great increase in, in, in workforce numbers. Uh, what we will see is a change in the composition, which I think uh, we need to think long and hard about. Dr. Wittenstein. So much of the health care reform conversations going on now is about payment reform and how we're going to change payment. But if you look at the Dartless studies and, and you look at some of the other studies about how the health care dollar is spent, a lot of it is around the choices we're making as, as physicians, as health care providers, as consumers about what we want to spend. And I, I hear when we talk about clinical effectiveness and how that's being built into health care reform, there was an immediate, but we're not going to use that to decide what to pay for, how to. How do you see uh, choices about where we spend our money? Do we spend a lot of money on palliative care at the end of life or not? How is that going to factor into health care reform and change the way we practice medicine and where we make the decisions about where the dollars go, which speaks to the inefficiencies that may exist, which in fact are oftentimes the choices that we're making? <laughs> That's too, too good a question for me to answer. Yeah. It's a really great question. I'll, I'll, I'll I, 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 go ahead. Well. Um, I think we should ask the patient, uh, patients what they want. Um, however, if you do that, uh, a lot of times um, what you get is, I want to live forever. That is to say, mortality is optional. I'll take that. Uh, right, right, yeah. Yeah. see, Let me see. <laughs> um, I want the finest health care that money can buy, and I don't want to have to pay for it. Um, so. We're conflicted. Uh, we're conflicted as a society. We're conflicted as, a, as professionals. We're conflicted as all the different stakeholders in the system. Um, you know, I think uh, our president said it uh, very, very effectively. We're all going to have to learn how to make some sacrifices uh, in, in, to get where we want to be. Uh, and that means having uh, everything f uh, from realistic expectations about what health and health care can and cannot deliver uh, what what it is we actually want out of life from our health care system uh, and what we expect from our our health professionals uh, in terms of realistic expectations that is culture change and that ain't easy I heard someone once say that the two keys to health reform are limiting choices and taking money out of people's pockets I'm not so, saying I endorse that. Um, <laughs> a, a couple of notes in response to that. One, with regard to the Dartmouth Atlas data that a lot of us have talked to, uh, have, have been discussing today. So I, I have a, maybe Joel, you can answer this. I have a, a, a basic question with regard to that data. If you look at the international comparisons of healthcare utilization in the United States to other countries, um, and Jerry Anderson from Johns Hopkins has done a lot of really important work in this area. What it shows is that our utilization isn't out of whack. The services people are getting is not what's out of whack. It's the prices that are out of whack, yeah. right? Then you look at the Dartmouth Atlas data, which points to different service utilization levels. So we have uh, Johns Hopkins and, and Dartmouth kind of fighting over this. I think geographically, UMDNJ is really perfectly positioned to <laughs> resolve this dispute. You could be kind of the, uh, the Switzerland of this. But, but it's, it really is. It's such a fundamental question, and we all discuss basic policy issues on the basis of the Dartmouth Atlas data, and, and I, I'm not sure that that really reflects what's driving cost in the American system, or, f or is fully uh, driving cost in the American system. But the, the other um, response, Dr. Wittenstein, I'd have to your question is, who's the we? Right? When we talk about we, what I, one of the constitutive characteristics of our system, and, and I, this is not clearly changing in health reform, is uh, that there is no central planning or direction capacity almost at any level from the community to the national level. So uh, I don't, if, if we decided we knew how, to, how we, we wanted to allocate resources, who would we communicate that information to? Uh, so, and, and again, I don't, the, unlike the Clinton health reform, and one of the reasons that this has 
a better chance of getting through, there is no we really created in any of the, the uh, versions of health reform that, that are circulating now. I think um, I would, um, I agree. When you look at the international studies, I mean, there are countries who with half the health expenditures per capita that we have with lengths of stay that are twice as long and they, a lot more service utilization and, and le lower co-pays and, and deductibles and it's because they pay their inputs less. And there's no question about it that one reason and perhaps the main reason why our health care costs are higher here is that the inputs to health care, and this is not just health, health professionals, in fact, that's a fairly small part of it, uh, just make a lot more money on it. And, um, but we don't talk about that in public, right? <laughs> because you can't talk about, you know, it's, first of all, it's un-American, it's uncapitalist to talk about those kinds of things. But I think when you look at the kinds of proposals that are floating around, you know, creating a federal government run health plan for those that don't have access to something else, that's creating the opportunity for payment systems that pay less, like Medicare has been doing for years now. So um, I think this is in the, the back of people's minds. Um, but I'll do on the other hand uh, on that, and that is, you, you know, I think the Dartmouth utilization analysis is, is um, uh, it speaks for itself. And we, are, we do a lot of things that don't seem to have very much benefit at all, and we have great outcomes where we do a lot less of those things, even within this country. So it makes some sense to start squeezing there. Uh, and then ultimately, and it may be another 30 years from now, um, you've got to hit the price side too. But I don't think that's what's going to happen this time around. I have a question over here. Yes. Um, my name's Dr. Sarah Osmond. I'm a, a physiatrist. I'm just concerned about long-term care. It's a um, costly issue now, and it's going to increase in cost. And I was wondering... Um, what you felt about academic centers and what their responsibility is to take care of special populations. I take care of uh, severely um, disabled children and adults, and it, it's a long-term uh, issue. It's from being, you know, throughout their lives they're going to require care. So it's not just your geriatric type of model. So um, I'll just be interested in your responses on how to control costs, and we'd love to work with academic centers. Thanks. Well, I, think, I think as these community models are developed, uh, you'll have more and more opportunity to do so. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a blur, uh, the line is blurred between what is society's responsibility and what is an academic health center's responsibility. And I think a discussion about that is very, very valuable. But I definitely see uh, um, the opportunity for much more collaborative activity uh, on long-term care. If, if you've looked at studies of the long-term care workforce, you know what a problem that is. Uh, you know what an issue it is for us, but we as a society need to value that uh, and, and help, uh, help develop the infrastructure to manage that. And um, we give it a lot of lip service and the rhetoric is way out in front of reality, but I think there's a glimmer of hope in that direction. Okay. One last question uh, before we bring on uh, Dr. Owen. Yes. Now, I'm sorry, it's the, actually the person that's behind you. Uh, my apology. Hi, uh, Jim Coromillis, cardiology. If we're really concerned about this major issue, then why do we just view it from a narrow box of what the system is like, and we say things that are un-American, like a single-payer system, are not to be considered? The private insurance companies spend 25 to 30 percent of the dollars that come in on administrative costs, salaries, and so on. Medicare spends 3 percent. So if it wasn't for the biases and the, that we have, why wouldn't we go to a single-payer system and then use that system? You don't have to decide how to pay, private, uh, to pay primary care physicians more. Someone with some sense has to ration, be rational and decide how to cut money that we as specialists say, you know, you see a specialist and they'll do a test that will tell you that they need a procedure to do. And that procedure is paid at a very high rate compared to what a primary care person um, would get. And I think the real answer is that we need a single payer system. Talk about silos, why do we need 80 different insurance companies, each with their own rules and regulations, and then you have to try to figure out how to deal with each of these companies rather than dealing with Medicare or a single payer system. 
I think one, one uh, sort of uh, answer to that question is that that's against 250 years of American tradition. You know, we haven't enacted the kind of social safety net uh, in the United States that you see in many other countries. Um, you feel it palpably when you visit other countries. Uh, there's a sense uh, of security that if I were to lose my job or if I were to get ill, you know, I know that I'm going to be well taken care of. I've had discussions with people from Canada and Europe who've uh, come to the United States for work who said their greatest fear was that they might fall ill in the midst of all these great academic health centers. So we're up against something that I would say is much bigger than a single payer or multiple insurance coverage, coverage or whatever. It's really the American psyche. It's that psyche of rugged individualism. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Why can't you do that? You know, um, uh, and, and, and as a result, I think as a society, we need to confront that in ways that we haven't been able to do for several hundred years. Until we do that, uh, until we decide that we want to have some type of security in that regards, until we want to uh, care more about each other as individuals uh, uh, than we do today, I don't think we're going to get there. You know, I, I certainly uh, agree uh, with that, and I would simply add two things. One is that um, uh, there's a deep mistrust of government in this country, and it's part, it's part of our political culture. Uh, and I think the, the, the promotion of fear, the fear-mongering that would go on, if single payer was actually seriously discussed, would be uh, it would make Harry and Louise from the last round of health reform seem quite quite tame. And I just think it's not in the realm of the politically reachable. On the other hand, here in New Jersey, in a referendum about what was it, uh, 15 years ago now, uh, the overwhelming majority of the voters said health care is a right. New Jersey can't afford to do single payer on its own. <laughs> and on that note, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for their comments and answers. Thank you. And as the first of the presidential uh, lecture series, it's uh, my privilege now to introduce my real boss, uh, Dr. Bill Owen, our newly invested but certainly uh, not entirely new president, uh, to provide his comments. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, and I want to thank you folks for coming out to what was absolutely a terrific discussion. I want to again thank our panelists and thank our provost for stimulating some uh, very provocative conversation. I asked Denise, what should I talk about, and she said, talk about two minutes. So, <laughs> I guess there is um, a story I want to tell that offers two different perspectives around the conversation that I heard here. And the story is of a young man strolling through a park, and he sees sitting on the bench a much older man, kind of grizzled and looking very fit. And he goes to him and he says to him, tell me a little bit about your life, sir. And this older man that he recognizes says to him, well, you know, I drank a lot of Jack Daniels. In fact, I used to drink every day. And you know, I used to smoke two packs of Newports every day. I partied all day, partied all night. Took pills to wake me up, took pills to get me asleep. Young man was taken aback by the older man's response and said, how old are you, sir? He said, 35. So where am I going with that? really two things. Uh, the first one is that I heard someone raise here, and I want to call out again for our panelists and for us to recognize, is the role of the patient. And two different aspects of the role of the patient. First of all, the role of the patient as a partner as we're talking about health care reform and expectations in a positive way. Um, as you know, I now play a doctor on TV, used to be a doctor, used to be a nephrologist and did a lot of international work, and I am reminded of how patients who develop end-stage renal disease respond in two countries, Canada and in the United Kingdom. End-stage renal disease, by definition, without an intervention of dialysis or transplantation, death is imminent, one to two weeks. And I am reminded in particular of when I was in UK once, uh, and I was rounding with one of the leading nephrologists at one of the big academic health centers, and he walked in the room and he told an older woman that she had end-stage renal disease. 
And unlike in the United States where the response is, am I eligible for a transplant or when do I start dialysis, her response was, thank you, doctor. Have you told my family? Can I go home? Very different response and very different expectation, and you can predict that they are for a very different long-term impact on cost. Let me give you the flip side of the patient role in choice in terms of driving the kinds of reform that you folks are talking about. And I will use the examples of the purple pill in Viva Viagra, direct-to-consumer advertising. If you do not think patient choice influences what you do, influences what the healthcare delivery system does, you're fooling yourselves. What happened to Maalox? But I will tell you, every patient knows about the purple pill. So that's one aspect of this. The other one that I will call out goes to something that one of the panelists talked about, and I certainly don't have an answer for it, but what is the boundary of the response of the academic health center around this issue? And that is, what is our role in terms of not so much focusing on what are the leading causes of death, so morbidity and mortality, but what is our role in terms of the leading causes of life? When have I heard an academic health center talk about the 10 leading causes of living? You know, we talk about, and we talked about a little bit here, physical health. Well, you know, what about conversations about mental health and spiritual health? And what is our role there? We talked about medical education. What about conventional education? Good old reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think those are all parts of the role of leading causes of life. So are we going to get our arms around that? I don't know, but I've got a feeling that people are going to have an expectation of us to do a bit of that as well. So in any case, I want to thank you all for coming out to our inaugural presidential lecture. I think you're going to find that these will be uh, a bit provocative and perhaps even a little bit different than what you're expecting from these sorts of lectures. Let me give you a little bit of a taste of what our next lecture is going to be on. It's going to be on conversations on leadership. And we're going to have four panelists. We're going to have a leader from athletics. We're going to have a leader from entrepreneurship and innovation. We're going to have a leader from business. And we're going to have a leader from the not-for-profit social asset sector talking to us to, about how to be good leaders in our profession and likewise good leaders within our organization. So I hope you folks will be able to come out and will again drive as wonderful a conversation as we heard here. And to our panelists and moderator, thanks for an absolutely terrific inaugural lecture. Thank you all. So now that we've uh, come to the end of our first lecture, I would invite all of you to join us for our reception and uh, enjoy the repast. Thank you. <laughs>